welcome to Study with the Best, the magazine show that's all about CUNY. I'm Tina Beth Pina. On today's episode, we'll take a look at the amazing creations recently built across CUNY. From the brand new graduate school I'm currently standing in to a boat simulator used by the U.S. Navy and Coast Guard. But first, it's a monumental achievement to bring a brand new graduate school into the CUNY system. Brooklyn College has done just that by opening the Fierstein Graduate School of Cinema. All right, Gillis, you've got five minutes. What's your story about? It's about a baseball player, a rookie shortstop that's batting 347. Uh-huh. Poor kid was once mixed up in the holdup, but he's trying to go straight. Uh-huh. Except there are a bunch of gamblers that won't let him. So they tell the poor kid he's got to throw the World Series or else, huh? More or less, except for the end, I've got a gimmick that's real good. Uh-huh. You got a title? The question oh, that we try to answer was what does a 21st century film school look like? If you're going to build it, what do you want in there? We've been very mindful of the level of quality that we wanted. We have 70,000 square feet between the two floors. We built it out to meet what we saw as the ideal structure for a film school. The curriculum is a very contemporary and a very well thought out curriculum. The students were handpicked. We have been very conscious of the need that we have to uh, have a very diverse group of students. They need to get the job done in a way in which they can have an impact, in a way in which they can be telling stories that are new and original and we're not just trotting out the same old tried and true stories that Hollywood keeps on selling. I am from Jamaica. Since the last year of my first degree, I've wanted to do film. I do believe I have some sort of a voice when it comes to social justice, but that's not yet fully developed, and that is a part of the process that's going to happen here. My voice is going to grow a little bigger, I hope. The facilities looked amazing. When I spoke to the faculty, I heard wonderful stuff and I figured they're new, I am very new to the industry, we can start this whole growth process together. I'm from Key West, Florida, so it, uh, I came a long way with the facilities here. The uh, staff, faculty, everyone involved is so representative of what film should be and it's, it's just nice. It's a great great, great place to create nice things. I applied, I accepted, and I moved to Brooklyn before even seeing the facility. So there was a lot of faith uh, in this, and um, I was not disappointed in the least. They're giving you everything that we need to, to do what we want to do, and they're putting it all on, on us. So there's nothing left in the air. It's on us to create what we want to create. It's on us to, to do good. Somebody had the idea um, of looking to place the school at Steiner Studios. The moment at which Doug Steiner expressed an interest, my sense is that everybody, you know, the lights went on. Everybody said, you know, this is an incredible idea. It seems so obvious to have a film school at a, on a working film lot and to be really the only, the only graduate school in the country that, that has that. We have the 4,000 square foot soundstage. We have three other production studios. We have a massive equipment room with beautifully designed uh, set of demo rooms for students to check in, check out equipment. We have a mocap studio. We have a beautiful student lounge which overlooks the skyline of Manhattan. Of course, we have this beautiful 4K screening room. And then downstairs, we have all the post-production facilities. We have an animation space. We have a render farm. Uh, it's, you know, it's the whole nine. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, the facilities are amazing. Things I don't have access to just on my own. All the professors and uh, just being able to be on Steiner Studios a lot so that we have that um, hopeful interaction with people in the business. It feels like we're part of a TV show, I guess is the best way to put it, like the production, sound studios, all that stuff, it's crazy. What makes our program different from a lot of programs is that we do have the MAs and the MFAs all in the same place. 
uh, mixing with each other and taking classes together. That is a plus when MFAs tends to be focused just on the production side. We really wanted to make sure that we had we emphasized studies as well, um, particularly film history um, and thinking about film and being able to talk about film outside of writing screenplays and so on. The idea is to really emphasize history, not only history but critical analysis, historical um, analysis as part of the filmmaking process. Film school is increasingly the path by which people go into the film industry. And unless you actively go out and find the right people, have a, you know, a commitment to diversity and inclusion in your recruitment process, it's not gonna change. And that's something that, as a CUNY, we're committed to do. And certainly Brooklyn College has got a long history of that commitment, and, and I think that's for the good all the way around. I'm in the directing track, um, so hopefully I can, I can come out of here um, with more knowledge on how to be successful in that. I'm not looking at it in such a specific way, I'm looking at it because I'm helping on, on a lot of crews and I'm doing different things for each crew and I'm learning so much every time. So it's kind of an all-encompassing experience for me. The film industry in Jamaica, at present, it's very small. And I want to be one of those persons that contribute to the growth and development of that. So I'm hoping to take this education, this experience, the people I get to meet here, the network I get here, to help to build that side of the world and the film industry there. My hope is that, you know, we'll maintain a level of quality, we'll maintain a level of consistency, and that stories that have not been seen or heard before will come out of the school and, you know, really reinvigorate the film culture. Architect Jonathan A. Shelsa lets us in on his latest collaborations between his City College students and his company, Opal. I have a very stern interest in computation and the ideas of how to generate new form in the computer, but also looking at both traditional analog tools for building as well as new, the new tools. I've been very fortunate to be able to work with students on a number of prototypical pavilions over the past couple of years. The former projects, the High Bowl Pavilion, and then the Flower Pavilion were gifted to the Parks Department, specifically for Fresh Kills Park. And we've been engaging in ideas on how could you create a temporary structure that could be put up and put down because they have very many events and they've been allowing us to do some material research and fabrication research but then also they provide meeting points around the park where visitors can come in and uh, get information from a steward of the park. The way that I give a general problem to students. So in this last one it was a matter of this, this curve folding as a structural principle and we ran an internal little design competition within the students and then we would bring in a panel of critics as well as the client and based on that we would all kind of combine around one specific strategy. One of the things that always happens is students kind of assume that you make a digital model and then you just turn it into a building and there is so much prototyping that happens in between those two periods. And it's such a feedback loop of making something and then learning from it, and making something and then learning from it. You need to engage in the physicality of making, even if you're in the digital realm. So it's a constant process of learning what the material wants to do, what the geometry wants to do, what the mechanical fasteners want to do, for example. So it goes into a whole other realm of reality. I recently received a, a map 
from the Parks Department, where they, one of their interns had made a little cartoon of the pavilion, and you can see it stamped at like different locations around the park of where it would appear on certain days. And it was just, it's very, it's very interesting to put these things out there and then have a life of their own. One of the things that I've been very interested in, a bit more theoretically in architecture, is the idea of the figure and how the figure plays a role, where the building components actually take on a communicative or uh, figural element in a sense. So uh, we did not start this last pavilion with the uh, idea that we would be using flowers or we would be aspiring to make flowers, but at some point during the process, you start to realize uh, a characteristic uh, of it and at that point, particularly given its setting in a park, uh, in a landscape, it almost starts to lend itself to a certain kind of quality and we start to nudge it a little bit in that direction. OPAL is an acronym for my office. Uh, it's co-founded with my partner, Jennifer Berkland. As a landscape architect, Jen is very conscious of how things fit within a larger sustainable environment. And I'm very interested in interiority or architectural interiority and how that would participate with the exterior landscape. So we have these conversations from different angles and it's, uh, I think it's one of the reasons why it's productive. I love making. My parents will tell you that that goes down to when I was a child and I was playing with Legos. I remember specifically when I went to uh, my undergraduate program because there was a wood shop. I remember calling home saying, I, I get to play with wood all day long, Mom. One of the really exciting things about CUNY right now is uh, we are looking to expand our facilities with more digital uh, fabrication equipment. So it's very exciting to be able to keep up with current, uh, the current building technology or even keep ahead of it so that students here are aware of what is to come in the future. When students in the Maritime program at Kingsborough Community College aren't out on the water learning how to pilot boats, they're honing their skills with a state-of-the-art ship simulator the college helped build. So let's do the following. Let's get Mr. Torres and Alex into ship four. Um, Colin is going to go into ship three with Captain Baez. And Paige is going to go into ship one by her lonesome. The ship simulator is something that Kingsborough is very proud of. It was developed with Buffalo Computer Graphics and Kingsboro uh, Community College. And then we have four individual ships, and the students can pilot the ships uh, using specialized controls that we developed with BCG. Paige, you are in Ambrose Channel. You're going to head northbound in Ambrose Channel towards the Verrazano Bridge. And Captain Baez and Mr. Skarka, you are in Sandy Hook Channel. I want you to head northbound into Chapel Hill Channel. Okay? and you are all under your own command of your vessel right now. We have four boats. All right, sold out. So we want to get inside the channel right now. It's an extremely specialized piece of equipment. Uh, it features radar, electronic chart plotting, a full console with engine controls, steering controls, autopilot, so it's very, very much mimics what they would use on a, uh, a modern vessel. I'm going to just pick up speed here just a little bit. All right. Just going to watch that film up to about 12 knots. See that? Yep, and then we're going to hold. We're going to hold right there, 12 knots. CUNY has really, really been generous with us in that we've been able to keep our classes relatively small, and so that gives us the ability to have very specialized instruction and a really good uh, student-to-teacher ratio and we feel that that's why our students come out of here with a first-rate education. We have uh, students that are New York City police officers, New York City firefighters. Uh, we currently have an ex-student who is the uh, second mate on the world's largest liquid natural gas carrier, and um, he's a Kingsborough graduate. He was also valedictorian at SUNY Maritime. We have another student that is in NOAA Corps. He went to uh, Kings Point, left Kings Point, and went to work for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Uh, we just had another student that recently graduated and he is um, working at uh, New York Power Authority in a power plant where he's uh, the power plant's operation manager in charge of generating electricity for the five boroughs in and around the city. So not everybody goes on boats. Um, the ones that do go on boats do very well, but they also have the ability to go and branch out into other fields that are related to maritime.
Not really going towards maritime, more towards marine biology and oceanography. So what I would do if I were you, I would slow down, bring it down to like six knots, but maintaining your course inside the channel here. I feel like a lot of people think that it's really hard because of the whole the electronics and whatnot for the simulators and stuff like that, but it's, it's not that bad once you get the hang of it. The ship simulator is, um, it's become such a successful program for Buffalo Computer Graphics that the uh, U.S. Army, uh, the United States Coast Guard, and the U.S. Navy have all adopted the Kingsboro Simulator into their programs. We're really, really proud of it. It's, uh, it's been a really good experience for myself and for the college that developed the simulator. The Eagle Academy was established more than a decade ago to help young men in the New York City area face educational challenges head on. And for its CEO and founder, the results have been amazing. This is a calling for me. This is absolutely not a job. And so this is my small way of, uh, of uh, doing what I can do uh, to make this world a better place. As the current president and CEO of the Eagle Academy Foundation, David Banks is making the world a better place by empowering at-risk inner city boys to become academic achievers and engaged citizens through education and mentoring at the Eagle Academy for Young Men. About a dozen years ago, um, you know, a number of us were, were taking a look at the issue of what was happening specifically to young men in our public schools. There were a couple of things that we were looking at which really drove home what this crisis was really all about. So one was a, a, a report uh, that Columbia University came out with that said that 75 percent of the inmates for the entire state of New York come from seven neighborhoods in New York City. I mean, so that for me, that just blew me away, number one. Number two, at that time, the graduation rate for African American and Latino males in New York City was just a little more than 30 percent. So you got to put the two of those together, and, uh, and then you realize that, you know, there were not a lot of organizations that were really trying to do much about it. And it was really that which gave rise to the creation of the Eagle Academy for Young Men as the first all-boys public school um, in New York City in more than 30 years uh, when we created it uh, back in 2004. Ten years later, the Eagle Academy for Young Men has grown from one school in the South Bronx into a network of six all-male public schools serving grades 6 through 12. We're the only educational reform organization that can lay claim to being in every single borough in the city, in addition to being in Newark, New Jersey as well. Uh, we now have over 2,000 students. Um, Long stretch from when we started with 100 boys in the ninth grade 11 years ago to now 2,000. And by the year 2021, we'll have over 4,000 young men who are part of the Eagle Network. We're in and around 80% graduation rates in a city that graduates um, African American Latino males only about 50%. So we're well above the, uh, the New York City and the national averages for sure. Um, and every young man that graduates from the Eagle Academy is accepted to colleges and universities all across the country. I've been accepted to the University of Pennsylvania, Cornell University, the University at Virginia, Syracuse University. Um, could you give me a second? Can I, I can't remember. It's a college-going culture. When all's said and done, we expect for these young men to go off to colleges and universities and to come back and, uh, and to be successful uh, in whatever the chosen endeavor that they have. The City University of New York plays an important role in these endeavors since the Eagle Academy can act as a feeder school to CUNY. Banks himself earned his education, administration, and supervision certification by simultaneously attending Brooklyn College, City College, and Baruch College in New York City. I'm a product of the New York City public school system. I was a New York City school teacher for six years. Uh, I was an assistant principal for two years. I was a principal for 11 years. Um, so I've, I've, I've run the whole gamut in terms of the New York City uh, public school experience, if you will, and I've seen a lot of things over the years that I've been able to bring all that experience to the work that we've done at the Eagle Academy and Eagle Academy Foundation. We're very, very excited about these young men as their lives have been transformed and, and now they're creating their own families and, uh, and being very successful. We've, we've been at this work now for over 10 years and um, it's been a real joy to see the, the young men who've, uh, who've made it and are continuing to make it. Because not only they're making it to be a success for themselves, but they turn around and they come back and they mentor and they work and they support their younger Eagle brothers. And I think that's the best thing that we can do.
Up next, we talk to artist and programmer Justin Blinder, whose inventions will make you reconsider what you share on the internet and how. We were always the family that kind of like had the worst technology on the block and like the slowest internet. And so uh, I was typically just trying to find ways to have access to better hardware. So I started off like building computers, for instance. I started building servers at my home and then also broadcasting some internet radio. So I think it was typically always about access and or lack of access to certain things that I, I wanted to get my hands on. I would consider myself an artist and also a programmer. But yeah, there definitely is like a conflict of interest uh, at times when I build these critical projects and then they're often critical of the companies that I, I might potentially work for or have the potential to work for at times. Snoozy the Sloth, this robotic breathing plush toy, was really started off as a critique about how a lot of human-human interactions are often being mediated through technology, so we're not actually interacting with humans as much. It hangs from you, so you'll feel the expansion and the con contractions of its, uh, of its chest, and then it'll also breathe onto you um, through its mouth. It kind of works on both levels. It works on a critical level, but also it could be a product. And for that one, uh, in, in that case, um, there was actually commercial interest in producing, using this law. WSSID stands for Weather Service Set Identifier, and the Service Set Identifier is just the wireless name that you would see on your phone or computer whenever you try to connect to a wireless network. And it's essentially just a hacked router that broadcasts uh, multiple SSIDs or identifiers, and they automatically update, and the router will pull in the most recent weather information and create a new identifier and update it. It really just asks the question, like, what other sort of things can we do with, uh, with these sorts of, of protocols and technologies? Part of, of the underlying commentary of the, the project is that all of this technology that's always on is also contributing or can seem to be contributing to climate change just by the, the use of electricity. So if it's always on, um, maybe if we used it um, to a greater potential uh, we might actually reduce the need for other tools. Dumpster Drive is a file sharing network for digital trash. It will delete the files, but right before that, it uploads them to a, a centralized server. So it's almost the, the dumpster cloud in a way. And anyone else who has Dumpster Drive installed can access and, and download files that are in this centralized dumpster. If we leave a book or a DVD on our stoop for somebody else to take, that's totally fine. Um, however, if we share that online with somebody else, we could get into quite, quite a bit of trouble. And so if there's only one instance, in this case being shared between individuals, what sort of laws is that transgressing in a way? And try, it's really trying to problematize the gray areas of copyright law. We get prompts from services like Facebook telling us what's on your mind today, or Twitter. They have these just sort of initial prompts that get you writing. And so I started thinking about what would it look like to have a network that has to do with what is unshared. And so the main paradigm I found in the real world that seemed to translate quite nicely was dumpster diving or rummaging through other people's trash in order to repurpose things. The last time I checked, which was in 2014, uh, there had been 40,000 users of the project, and uh, there had been about 215 gigabytes of data that had been deleted and repurposed. And this extended into an additional project called Waste FM. Tools like Spotify and Pandora often recommend us songs based on different algorithms, but what happens to the artists who are outside the periphery of those algorithms? By looking at the songs that people no longer want and they delete, we might be able to actually see uh, what some of those artists might be or uh, get almost anti-recommendations, uh, which to me is kind of fascinating in an era where uh, serendipity is kind of like engineered in a way. Rethink is a Firefox extension that allows you to view environmental accountability data for different corporations uh, and it, it exposes that data on the corporation's websites. It, it is very empowering for users. Um, if you have this tool, 
Monsanto can't do anything if you go to their website and it has a lot of negative information about them posted on their website. Vacated uh, uses cached outdated imagery in Google Street View in order to show before and after changes of the city. There are a lot of different depictions or visualizations and maps of gentrification and, and the gentrification that happened from Bloomberg's rezoning. But what's often missing is uh, the context in which that's happening and what happens on a ground level perspective. A lot of the projects I work on really just try to expose or address a lot of the underlying power dynamics and political economies of digital tools. Google and Facebook and Twitter uh, aren't really just free tools that are designed for us and that's the end of the story. That's our show for today. For more information on what you just saw, log on to our website at cuny.tv or check out our Study with the Best Facebook page. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Bye.